You're on? Okay. Thank you very much. So, pleasure to be here. I'm the uh, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Medical Officer of Brainstorm Cell Therapeutics. And I'm going to give you an update on our uh, progress. Uh, 2020 should be a very exciting year for us. Uh, we're a publicly traded company, so here's our disclosure statement, uh, similar to others. Uh, what's different about Brainstorm Cell Therapeutics? Well, first of all, uh, we have uh, about a 12 or 14 year history of developing cellular therapeutics. I think we have a very strong technology platform, uh, CMC, and IP protection. Uh, we have a laser focus on neurodegenerative diseases, uh, particularly ALS, uh, which is in phase three, and progressive MS, which uh, contrary to my prior speaker, uh, is in phase two, so uh, it's a surprise to you maybe. Uh, we have a very strong uh, uh, background of uh, preclinical work across the neurodegenerative disease spectrum, including animal models of Parkinson's disease, Huntington's, and so on. Uh, the uh, un unmet medical need and the market opportunity for these diseases is huge, and I think that we're well positioned to uh, bring something new uh, to the fore. Uh, this is our pipeline. As I mentioned, uh, our ALS trial is now fully enrolled, and we'll have top-line data this year towards the fourth quarter. Uh, we have a progressive MS trial, which is also being conducted at the U in the U.S. at the top MS centers, including uh, uh, Stanford, which is very close to this uh, conference. And uh, we are about half enrolled, and we'll have uh, some data this year. Uh, we have uh, preclinical work in other diseases that I already mentioned. Um, the technology platform is, uh, uh, very adaptable to commercialization and scale-up. We use uh, patients' own cells, so we avoid the issue of allogenicity. Uh, the cells are derived from the bone marrow in a 20-minute procedure. It's done as an outpatient. The patient goes home an hour later, and the cells are transferred to the manufacturing facility. We take the advantages of autologous products. We combine them with the convenience of off-the-shelf allogeneic by using a cryopreserved intermediate product. So this is a huge technology advance, which again allows a single draw of cells to produce years of treatment. And the cells are contained in um, ampules that are frozen. And every time a product is needed, there's a seven-day cycle from thawing the cells to delivering them in a labeled uh, tract syringe to the, to the treater in the hospital. And I think it's the development of this technology platform that's allowed us to consistently and reliably deliver a cellular therapy to uh, patients. The question then is, how, why would a cellular therapy be beneficial for neurodegenerative disease? Well, as you know, uh, cells are con continually communicating with each other. They do that with uh, large molecules and biological molecules, including microRNA. And it's, uh, there's a huge opportunity to take cells as a drug delivery system inject them directly into the spinal fluid through a lumbar puncture, and then use the CSF delivery system to take it all the way to, uh, to the targets. And there's a lot of science behind this that uh, we can talk about after the question period. Again, uh, our ALS trial, this is our fourth trial. Uh, we recently published the results of our phase two randomized trial in the journal Neurology uh, the, just last month. And as I mentioned, this year you'll see our top line data. Our phase two study had a very traditional uh, study design. You see this over and over again in ALS where there's a run-in period. Patients get qualified, meet screening criteria. We then did a bone marrow aspirate to get the cells. We needed a few weeks to produce the product. We did CSF analyses before and after treatment, so we have a very heavy biomarker uh, program that uh, has really enlightened us and shown us the, the way to go. Uh, and uh, then we do monthly assessments of standard ALS outcome measures, which, is, which includes the ALS functional rating scale, uh, vital capacity, which is a measure of breathing, and other standard ALS outcome measures. In all of our studies so far, and even in our re most recent DSMB data, we're seeing very remarkable safety. Uh, in our phase two study in particular, we saw no deaths or treatment-related SAEs. There was not a single dropout due to an SAE. And the most common adverse events were related to the procedure itself. In other words, the administration of cells, some back pain, headache, and uh, limb discomfort. But uh, those were transient and uh, did not persist past a day or two. 
We had uh, a very nice surprise in our uh, phase two study. This was a 48 patient study. The randomization was three to one. Uh, so three on treatment, one on placebo. Uh, the top graphs show you the uh, change in the ALS FRS slope on the y-axis. On, uh, it shows you the data for the whole group and also for rapid progressors. And over and over uh, in ALS trials, it's become apparent that rapid progressors are the group where you're most likely to see a treatment response. Um, it's not a surprise. Rapid progressors are defined as those who have a treatment decline of at least a point per month, which is the average rate of decline for ALS population. So it's about half the ALS population. You can see on the bottom, if you do a responder analysis, you look at the proportion of treated subjects who had a one and a half point per month improvement, you can see that there's also a very promising signal. We then went on to look at biomarkers. We looked at uh, the biomarkers of the products that the cells deliver. In other words, we're confirming the Amazon.com delivery to your house. And we're showing that the cells are delivering uh, molecules that are very important in ALS including VEGF, HGF, and leukemia inhibitory factor, not on placebo on the bottom. You can see that the cells also produce a pharmacodynamic effect that's very consistent. There's a reduction in inflammatory mediators, and as the previous speaker told you, neuroinflammation is a very important part of the diseases we treat, and you can actually measure them, and they're very tightly correlated with the disease prognosis. And we measured uh, MCP1, also known as CCL2, SDF1, and KIT1, or chitotriacidase. Uh, we uh, have a phase three study that's well underway. Uh, we changed a few things from phase two to phase three. First of all, phase one was a single treatment. Phase three is repeated dosing, so that's one change. The other thing is that we're treating exclusively the population of rapid progressors. They're identified in the run-in period by having monthly assessments of their ALS, FRS, R. And uh, we select the group that are declining by at least a point per month. That's the minimum amount of decline that's needed to enter the study. We also have limits on age, uh, breathing capacity, and we've excluded a number of uh, confounders that would make it difficult to show the treatment outcome. So we've excluded a drug called Adaravone, which was just approved at the time of our study design. We've also excluded uh, mechanical ventilation, feeding tubes. The study has 100 in each treatment arm. So this is a very rigorous, standard, uh, conservative uh, study design with a very high power, 90% power to show study efficacy. Uh, the uh, outcome measures are the ALS uh, functional rating scale, uh, safety, obviously, uh, ALS FRSR change from baseline, SBC, tracheostomy free survival, and we have probably the most ambitious biomarker program in ALS. Uh, I, knew, I do know that because I worked at all the companies that are uh, doing work in ALS, and we have seven serial CSF samples on each subject, uh, which are paired between serum and CSF, and they're spun and frozen, and uh, the technical analysis that you can do on this is really quite remarkable. We're looking at a lot of the biomarkers that we've uh, discovered in phase two that have uh, correlated with the clinical outcomes. So for example, MCP1 uh, post-treatment correlates with VEGF production. It also correlates with the improvement scores. So we're following up on that. We also have some new leads in terms of microRNAs that we know the cells produce that are not normally found in, um, in, in, our, in our cells. And we think that these microRNAs both have a ability to neuroprotect and also reduce inflammation. We're pursuing that quite avidly. What's the status of our ALS phase three trial? Well, as I mentioned, we completed enrollment in uh, October. Uh, the study sites in the US are Mass General, UMass, Mayo Clinic, uh, CPMC in California, in San Francisco in this town, Stamp, um, UCI and Cedar sinai These are the top ALS experts in the United States. We had two DSMB reviews already. We had one last year and one just recently in October. Uh, very happy to report that the uh, DSMB reviewed um, all the clinical trial data to date and have asked us to continue the trial and not make any modifications at all to the study protocol. It's a very important uh, next step getting ready for uh, final data and eventually uh, a BLA submission. We expect top line data in the fourth quarter of this year. Uh, all the participants have been enrolled 
at all the sites, so there's no new enrollment going on. And we're very, uh, very excited, uh, to say the least, a little anxious, but also excited about uh, getting to the finish line. Certainly the ALS community is uh, watching this with, uh, with bated breath, and uh, I can tell you that all around the world, the ALS community is really quite motivated to see us succeed. We have a very interesting phase two a progressive MS clinical trial, and I'll just briefly talk about that. Uh, we submitted an IND uh, in November uh, uh, 2018. Uh, 30 days later, we had our IND approved. So we have a very strong program. We're working with the top centers in uh, the United States, including Dr. Fred Lublin and Jeff Cohn and others uh, here at Stanford and across the US in Boston and other sites. Uh, we're using validated, very standard uh, MS uh, clinical trial uh, outcome measures. I was involved in most of the MS uh, drugs that you're, you see on the market today at uh, Biogen and uh, Novartis. I can tell you we're doing exactly the same trial design. It's really no difference. And in addition, there's been some tremendous progress in MS around biomarkers, and we're following that progress. We have interesting collaborations with uh, Amsterdam University Medical Center that are the, really the world leaders in neurofilament uh, assays. Uh, as I mentioned, we have five, five clinical trial sites. We're half enrolled the study. Uh, we've done some natural history work as well using the same endpoints. We're doing some advanced quantitative MRI, and we expect to be sharing some data uh, this year. Uh, the DSMB met uh, just uh, last month, and again, a uh, very good outcome. Uh, They've recommended that the trial continue without modification to the protocol. We expect top-line data roughly around the same time as our ALS data. And again, this is very uh, important for us as a small company to have uh, more than one indication. So we have a technology platform that really plays out well across a number of indications, but also to have the results from one clinical trial program reinforce uh, the other. We have a very strong leadership team at our company. Again, uh, the panel this morning talked about uh, company experience. Uh, uh, Heim Leibovitz is our CEO. He'll be here today if you want to meet with him. His plane got delayed, so apologies for that. Arturo Arayo was the commercial lead at this Novartis Cell and Gene Therapy Unit. Um, I was a senior vice president at uh, Biogen and a business unit head at uh, Genzyme in the past. Preetam Shah is from Wall Street. Many of you know him. He was from Barclays Bank. He's our ch chief financial officer. And Uri Yablanka is our chief uh, business officer. Uh, Yosef Levy does our cell manufacturing. His PhD thesis uh, 14 years ago was on the cells that we're now delivering. So there's been very good continuity of care, so to speak. Uh, Reva Talarisha is our uh, head of R&D. She's from the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And she has managed to abscond several very good scientists from Weizmann to join our company. And uh, we have um, over half of our employees are PhD bench scientists. We do our own research, do our own technology development. We do our own preclinical work. And we do our own biomarker work, but we do farm out to uh, experts uh, when needed. Uh, Mary Kay Turner is our head of patient advocacy and government affairs. She's been doing this for 30 years. I think she knows everyone in uh, Washington. And Susan Ward's our head of clinical development. She, I stole her from Pfizer, and I apologize, but I, I couldn't help myself. Um, so thank you very much. I'll leave time for questions and uh, look forward to an exciting year. So I think the first question is, um, is an evolving landscape in ALS? There, I think there's uh, over 50 failed clinical trials. Right now there's two approved therapies. Uh, there's really no therapy available that has a significant impact in terms of disease stabilization. That's the focus that we have. We want to try to stabilize ALS. I don't believe that there's any treatment in development now that will be a cure, so to speak. The other way to look at it is, you know, where are we in the biological uh, continuum of ALS? There are upstream events in terms of genetic abnormalities, and there's downstream events uh, in terms of functional impairments, and there's everything in between. 
What we've done is we've focused on pathways that we believe are tractable, that can be treated, and using biomarker confirmation. So we believe that neuroinflammation is a very important outcome in ALS. MCP1, which we've measured, is the strongest predictor of survival in, in ALS. There's been some recent work on that. All the biomarkers that we have measured correlate very clearly with functional decline in ALS. So we believe that that's where we're playing in that space. There are um, the, the disadvantage of the upstream treatments, and I think they're important, but the disadvantage is they treat very small percentages of the population. So they have to be very, you know, super niche uh, opportunities. The other thing is that once ALS is diagnosed, and if you look at the people that arrive in our clinical trial, out of a normal score of 48, most of them are 38 or less. And that's just normal for ALS. So most of the secondary disease processes have already, have already kicked in. In other words, neuroinflammation and this degenerative process that seems to feed upon itself. So it's not clear to what extent that upstream genetic modifications will, will correct that. I think that we're all hoping that, you know, everything for ALS is, is going to be beneficial. But we're somewhere in the middle of that. We're not a symptomatic treatment. We're a disease-modifying treatment. And we're focused on the, uh, the individual pathways that we believe we can measure and confirm with our treatment. One of the advantages of delivering a treatment into the spinal fluid, in addition to a privileged delivery system, is that you can actually measure the treatment effect directly. And I know one of the speakers today is going to be talking about getting around the blood-brain barrier, but I think for the moment it's really a conundrum, and I think we have to respect that. In terms of partnering opportunities, we're definitely open to uh, commercial partnering opportunities. Um, we, um, we've had a number of discussions, and we hope to, we're having some more today and over this week. And if anybody's interested in uh, meeting with us, uh, we're definitely open for business. So I'll, 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 I'll end there, because I think I got, I got beeped here that I'm, I'm done, right? Oh, I have one more minute. Oh, okay. It just beeped me. Sorry. Right, so the CSF delivery system um, is, is uh, continuous along the, along the penetrating blood vessels. So the uh, penetrating arterioles in the brain uh, pulsatilely deliver um, all molecules and cells. There's no barrier, there's no diffusion involved. Once it gets into the brain uh, tissue, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a boundary between the periarterial CSF space and the interstitial uh, fluid space within the brain. And that is really a, a negative sink because the aquaporin molecules on the astrocyte foot processes produce a water sink that pulls it through. And that's, that system is called the glymphatic system. Uh, it's, been, it's been recently termed that. So we know that that system exists. I think the reason that treatments like Spinraza, which I was involved with at Biogen, are able to get everywhere is because of this system that exists. We deliver a similar size molecule. And we know that uh, VEGF and HGF and the various molecules and, and anti-inflammatory cytokines and microRNA that our cells deliver can actually flow through the same system directly to the brain itself. Um, in terms of the persistence of the cells in animal models, it's in the order of two or three months. We treat, we repeat dose patients after two months, so we put a new set of hockey players out on the ice every two months to, uh, to replenish the, uh, the drug delivery device that we're ba essentially loaning to the uh, loaning to the patient for two months and then we put a new set of drug delivery devices into the system and we believe very strongly that the csf system is a very effective and proven uh, delivery system for brain therapeutics thank you very much